So as I went in my last year at Multnomah School of the Bible where I went to college, um, there was, you know, all kinds of couples matching up, and there was one particular couple that caught everybody's attention, and his name was Skip, and he was the student body president, he was a good-looking guy, he was talented, um, but he wasn't stuck up, he was very approachable, and then there was this beautiful head cheerleader named Debbie, and, uh, you know, everybody was thinking, oh, wouldn't that be cute, and they got together, and started dating, and then eventually in the spring they got engaged, and, and I heard they got married sometime in the summer. And it was that wonderful picture of two beautiful, godly people that find each other, and, and you don't even really say it, but in the mind you're saying, happily ever after. They've got it made. And I heard later that year through the, the grapevine that they had been involved in a terrible accident, and, and even though they both came out alive, Debbie ended up paralyzed from the waist down for the rest of her life. And all of a sudden, the picture changes. It goes from, oh, you complete me, and isn't that romantic, and that's wonderful, to they've got to get a car that can take care of a wheelchair, and he's got to help her out of, the wheel, out of this car into the wheelchair, and they've got to get an apartment where it's got wide doorways and a bathroom that can be ADA accessible. And I think... When we think of love, we often want the romantic, easy kind. And I believe that as we look at the scripture and honestly as we look at life, what we need is the deeper, lasting, permanent Jesus kind of love, which the Bible calls the agape kind of love. And in this series, we're talking about we. We're talking about how my relationship with Christ should radically alter the way that I relate to other people. And we're looking at different relationships. And, and this week, we're going to be looking at marriage. And so the first week we talked about the picture from John chapter 15 that, that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches that we have to draw our life and our love and our purpose and everything and, and the tighter we are connected and the more permanently and continuously we draw from Jesus, the more we bear fruit, the more there's a life that is, is giving not only joy to us but honor and wonder to God. So we've talked about that and then the second week Pastor Will talked about how not only being loved by Jesus, but when we love the least of these, when we give them in practical terms, a cup of water, some food, something to, to say, I care about you, that we are loving Jesus. And, and I hope that that resonated as you thought through this week who the least of these is for you. And then this week we're talking about specifically we equals God and me, my relationship with God. And then how does that relate to the spouse, to the person that I'm married to? And I know that as soon as I say that, half of you check out and say, well, this is not about me because I'm single. And there are a number of kinds of singleness. Some of you may be single and never have been married and you're still hoping that that right person will come along. Some of you may have been married and you've tragically lost your spouse through some kind of a loss or death. Um, some of you may be divorced and it was an ugly and problematic situation, a process that left you single. And, and I want to just say this, that as we're talking about relationships, everything I'm going to share is also for single people. Because we're talking about a picture of how Jesus loves and what his love is like and, and how he loves us and how that empowers us to love others. And if you have a spouse, we're going to kind of lean in on that this week. But if you don't have a spouse, it is totally applicable to how you love your friends, your parents, the, the people that God has put in your life for you to serve. And so I don't want you to check out. I want you to listen carefully. And, and I have a, a further encouragement to singles a little later on. So I want to start a, a story that I think is a compelling story of Jesus' life. It's one of my favorites, and it's from John chapter 13. And if you don't have your Bible open, if you'd open there or flip open the version app on your phone. And I'm going to start reading, but I know it's a familiar story to a lot of us but I want you to think about what it might have been like to be in that room. I want you to try to listen, not with, oh, I know this, but ah, that is an amazing story. So John chapter 13, verse 1. It says, it was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So, Jesus had been pouring out his life for the multitudes, but particularly for the 12 disciples who 
worked and walked and lived and ate with him. And now he's realizing that that time is done. The three years is done. And he's on the, the day before he's going to be betrayed and crucified. And, and tragically, the disciples are going to walk away and leave him. And, and in this moment, before the, the chaos comes, he's got what's called the Last Supper. And they sit down at a meal. And it says the evening meal was in progress. And he's already mentioned that this is the Passover feast. This is when Jesus is going to tell them, this is my body that's broken for you and the way that we remember the sacrifice of Jesus through communion. And this is a, a part of the story you don't always tie with that Last Supper. And it says, the evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simeon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And so he got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So it starts off first with a clear statement that Jesus was absolutely clear about who he was and where he was going. And so it it says he knew that the Father had put all things under his power. That he was no longer to be just the humbled servant that was walking around in the dusty earth. That he was in fact the King of kings and Lord of lords. And that after his crucifixion he would rise again and that he would be living in that power. And then it says, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So clearly he's not operating in a way where he feels insecure. He's not trying to make them like him. He is not trying to to be impressive. It says he knows clearly who he is and what he's doing, why he's doing it. And because of that, it says, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin. But I want you to see that the clarity that that his, this passage, these couple of statements at the beginning bring. It says, He loved them already, but now he was going to love them fully to the end, not only to the end of his life, but to the nth degree, to the the final degree. And it says, so he gets up from the, the meal. And these disciples that he spent so long convincing that he is the Messiah, that he's God, and and they finally see him as, as their Lord and their master. And then he blows their minds. Because it says, what does he do after that? It says, he gets up and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Can you imagine the tension in the room? Here's Jesus, and it says he takes off his outer cloak, and he bends down, he gets a towel, he wraps it around his waist, and he takes it and he starts taking their filthy feet that are sandals that have been walking in dusty, dirty manure-strewn roads all day. It, it was the job of the lowest servant, not the job of the rabbi. In fact, it would have been unthinkable in their world for a rabbi who they considered to be the, the top of the social order to step down and do something so demeaning, so humbling, so awkward. And he goes, and, and you think about it, there's there's 12 guys in this room at least and he's, he's going one by one and he takes their sandals off and he washes them and, and then he dries them. And I don't know if you've ever had somebody wash your feet. There are some churches that do it like we do communion as a remembrance and we have done it a few times in a demonstration. And I tell you, it's awkward. It's awkward to have your feet washed and it's awkward to, to wash somebody else's feet. And, and so he's going around And he washes the disciples' feet knowing that they're going to run off totally scared to death and leave him. He washes Judas' feet that's going to sell him for a few pieces of silver. And as the tension grows, as he goes around the room, and then he gets done, and he says this, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to this place. Do you understand what I have done for you? (laughs) I think the answer is no. No, they didn't understand. He said, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. 
Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. That's an incredibly important line. He says, I want you to wash each other's feet, not just literally making somebody take their shoes off and and wash their feet, but his statement is, because of the love that I have for you, I want you to then do the practical, common, humble yourself and serve each other. Do the thing that nobody would think would be appropriate for you to do because you're too good for that. And I want you to to be the kind of community, the kind of connection, the kind of fellowship that cares for each other in that deep and personal and humble way. And I don't know how that strikes you. I don't know that picture of saying not only did Jesus wash their feet, but that he is calling us to a life of foot washing. That he's calling us to in very practical ways. Isn't it interesting, even last week he said, you fed me, you gave me something to drink, you clothed me. In this case, he's washing their feet. You know, I think sometimes love is seen as, as a great emotion to have or a great feeling towards someone. And, and you look at these examples and they are very practical ways of meeting somebody's needs, of doing something to express my love. And so he says, you've watched me do this. Now I want you to go and do that. I want you to be that kind of a follower of mine. So let's look at what this means from Jesus' point of view, how he loved. And he lived a life of love, which is what Ephesians calls us to do, that we are to live a life of love. And how do you know what that looked like? Well, it looks like Jesus. And when people say they're learning a lot in their Bible or they're growing spiritually or they're going to a lot of meetings, one of the questions I always want to ask is, Do you love God more and are you loving people more like Jesus did? Because that's the measure of are you really growing spiritually? Are you really moving somewhere? And it says that he knew clearly who he was. That he wasn't doing this to appease somebody. He wasn't doing it to fit in. He was not doing it because he was hoping they would like him. It says he clearly knew that he had been placed in the position of power that God had for him. He had been called to something. And you could literally say he was the king of kings and lord of lords. And I think it's beautiful when people begin to serve, not hoping that somebody's going to notice, not for thanks, not for glory. They just serve because they have such a deep gratitude for what Christ has done for me. And so, if you don't need to convince people of your value because you already know you have great value because of Jesus' love for you. It, it may be the same activities, but the spirit is completely different. So he, he had all this confidence, and then it says he clearly knew his mission. He came from God and was going back to God. And what, what was the mission of Jesus on this earth? It was to spread the glory of God the Father everywhere. It was to... a move towards the place where people would know the majesty and the greatness and the power and the love and the grace of God. And when he hands off that mission to his disciples and then they handed it off, and that's what mission that comes down to us. In a beautiful phrase in the prophets, it says that someday the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as water covers the sea. That we are in the process of not expanding a church program or a church organization, but of combining with other believers around the world to make God known, to make him famous, to make him seen, to make him something that people would want to have a relationship with, so, someone that people would want to have a relationship with. So it says because he was clear about who he was and what he was supposed to do, then he knelt down, he took up a towel, and he started washing their feet. And there's a a very, very powerful little story in the middle of that, which I think you need to understand because at the end of this chapter, he says, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for each other. That this is the mark of a follower of Jesus. 
And, and I don't mean foot washing in the sense that you wash everybody's feet, but the foot washing kind of love is what's supposed to characterize anybody who claims to be a follower of Jesus. And so there's a very interesting little story here about Peter. And you know, Peter's the, the impulsive one who speaks and then thinks, and sometimes he's saying what everybody else is thinking. But in the middle of this, Jesus is working his way around the room and he is washing the disciples' feet and he's taking time with each one of them and he comes up to Peter. And predictably, <laughs> Peter jumps up and says, you are not washing my feet. And, and I don't know, but I'm guessing that Peter had the best motives in the world. I, I think he finally got that Jesus was the Lord and Master and I don't want you to humble yourself and I, I don't want, maybe I don't want the awkwardness, but I, I don't want to demean you. And Jesus looked at Peter right in the eye and he spoke directly to him because that's the only kind of language Peter understands. And Jesus said to him, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part with me. And of course, then Peter does the opposite. He, he goes from the, this ditch into the opposite one and he says, oh, don't just wash my feet, wash my body as well. And Jesus makes this kind of cryptic statement. The one who's taken a bath, the one who is clean, doesn't need to have a bath again. They just need to have their feet washed. And there's this powerful picture of partly how we're to love each other, that Christ is the one that cleanses us and where we get forgiveness. But in the daily struggle of life that we are to encourage and challenge and we are to wash each other's feet. And I, and I think this is a great picture because if you would look at this little cup, maybe this is our, our capacity to love. And there, there's not very much in it. I think when people go through the, the difficult times they often have in their homes and the difficult times we have in our world, it, our ability to give and receive love gets damaged. And so we often feel like, you're asking me to love people that are unlovely, you're asking me to love my spouse in such a way that I would lay down my life, and it's like, I, I don't have that much. I gotta protect this, I gotta hang on to this. Let's not get crazy here. Because if you think about it, Peter was refusing to let Jesus love him. In fact, I think this is an important part of it. He says, he says in this formula, he says, sharing involves giving and receiving. That sharing, to be sharing, has to be received and it has to be given. And so Jesus is kneeling down and he is pouring out his love, literally, by washing their feet. And Peter's going, nope, nope, sorry, my cup, don't pour it here. And Jesus looks at him and he says, if you don't let me pour love into you, you don't have any part, you're not a follower of mine. And then Jesus, then Peter does the opposite and goes overboard. But I think that's a powerful picture. Some of you are good at receiving love. You, you want everybody to take care of you. You want people to do things for you. And, and you're focused on how to make the world fit so that people are reasonable and do it your way. And then there are some of you that are really, really good at giving. But when you have a need, you don't want to tell anybody. You don't want to be embarrassed that somebody brings a meal to your house. Or you don't want to be embarrassed that somebody has to do something for you. And those who are good givers need to learn to be good receivers. And those who are good receivers need to be good givers. And I think the beautiful part of this is that when you allow Jesus to pour into your life, when you begin to say, how do I get an experience of the love of Jesus in my life so that I don't feel like I have nothing, I feel like I'm full. And then the beautiful part is as you pour it out to somebody else, you have this confidence that Jesus is going to pour into you again. And as you pour it out, in fact, the more you do it, the more you realize that Jesus pours into you and you can pour out out of the overflow because I am loved incredibly deeply, continuously, and that that love has an unending supply. And for some of you, that's the message you need to hear today. No matter whether you're married or single, you need to say, how am I at letting Jesus love me? Because you can't, get away what, you can't give away what you don't have. And I want to specifically then move into talking about marriage. What does it mean to be married and what does it mean to be single? 
And I want to say a word to singles before we focus in on marriage. And the word to you is, I know that singleness can be extremely hard. And I want to just understand that often the Christian church world is very couple-oriented, very family-oriented, trying to help marriages, trying to help parenting. And, and those of you who are single may feel left out. And, and I realize that one of the struggles that you have is loneliness, to feel like there's anybody there for you and you get a good friend, you get a close-knit group and something happens, you move, they move, something has to happen. And I realize that that's a, a unique struggle that you go through. And some of you who are single parents, it is overwhelming, especially through this COVID crisis and the homeschool teaching or the, the online school teaching. And for some, the scripture says that because you are single, you have a unique opportunity. You may have more time and more ability because you're not being absorbed by pouring it into a family. And I, I think it's, it's also clear that as we talk through this, that in marriage, there's this sandpaper rubbing back and forth of your sinfulness and their sinfulness banging against each other in a sense that brings tension and struggle and pain sometimes, but it also gives you a much clearer view of your own selfishness and of your own struggles. And if you're single, you may be insulated from that. You may have nobody that can speak truth into your life and to say, you know, when you say that, it sounds like this. Or, boy, that was kind of arrogant. And you may not have that person in your life. So as a single person, we want you to be fully feel a part of family church community. We want you and, and couples and singles to be able to mix together in life groups in a way that, that is challenging and encouraging to all. But let me focus in specifically on three things as we go through, and that's why I say it's for everybody. We're going to be talking about the one another's in Scripture. And in your, in your uh, outline there, there's a whole list of the one another's of Scripture. And actually, that's not even all of them. It's just how the Scripture keeps saying, here's how you should be one to each other. And I want us to look at that, that the Bible is not only a great devotional manual, and sometimes we look at it as how you treat people at church. I, I want to tell you it's also a great marriage manual. Can you imagine a marriage in which you practiced all of the things that he says one another's, that that meant husbands and wives are doing this. And I, I'm going to cover three of them this week, and next week we're going to come back again and look at another example of how powerful Jesus' love is, and then we're also going to look at how does that apply in our marriage. So I'm going to go through this as the ABCs. But last week, Pastor Will talked about order of operations. And sometimes when people come to church, when they come to a relationship with Christ, they think, I want to be with God because he's going to make my marriage better, that that's really the motive. And uh, the order of operations means whatever's inside the parenthesis, that's what you focus on first. And I want to switch this, as Will did, and say, first of all, it's about, I need to focus on God in me. It's so easy to want to fix your spouse. It's so easy to want to, to try to say, if they would only. And I want us to say, God, I want to be filled up with your love. This is the most important thing, is I need to learn how to receive and experience the love of God. So then I have plenty of love to give. So the first A, we're going to do A, B, C. The first letter here is from Romans 15, 7. And it says, accept one another just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. You see, when I start looking at all these one another's of forgiving one another and encouraging one another and being devoted to one another, one of my selfish instincts is to say, well, I wish I was in that kind of relationship. Because what does it mean to be accepted? It means that somebody says, I see you. Not a facade that you're putting on, not, not a, a hopeful uh, expectation I'm putting on you. I, I really see how you are. And I really love you just like you are. And I want to be with you. I want to be connected to you. And he says, when I, when I think of that, I think, I want to be accepted like that. I don't want people to keep trying to change me and criticize me and, and try to, to make me different than I am. And he says, oh yeah, you have been accepted. That the reason you can accept other people is on the same basis that Jesus took you just as you are. That he's accepted you and knows you and absolutely understands. So the first A is we need to learn to accept one another. 
And what does that mean in terms of our relationships? It means that <laughs> opposites attract and then opposites attack. It, it means that it's easy for us to be attracted to one part of somebody's personality and then the backside of that becomes something that <laughs> we love, honor, and annoy for the rest of our lives. Because acceptance means I understand your personality. I understand your beliefs. I understand your thinking. I understand your choices and your desires and, and your preferences. And I love you whether I agree with those or not, whether that's like me or not that I don't need to change you to love you. I accept you through the ups and downs. I, I accept you if we're the beautiful couple at Multnomah or if you're in a wheelchair and you're paralyzed. And, you know, that's why at the beginning of our marriages we make those vows for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health. And you can't say um, for better, in health, and, and for wealth. You, you can't choose half of those. It's, it's the idea that through the circumstances of life, and, and you know, I think, I think most of us could be sued for uh, false advertisement in our dating stages. Um, we're trying to come across and put out our best self and look really good, and, and the truth is, is, after we get married, a lot of the other stuff comes out. And so acceptance means, I love you as you are, and I will continue to love you as you change and as you're different, and, and there's all kinds of changes that happen through life. And it's an acceptance of who you are and how you are. And then the second one, the B, is be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. It literally means being long-tempered. And you know, the sad truth is, for me, is I can be so patient with a stranger, I can be so patient with somebody else's kids, but boy, when my wife says something that's irritating or harsh or critical, man, I, I can be so quickly annoyed. And he says, I want you to be long-tempered. I want you bearing with one another. And he gives us the run-up to it. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. And we've talked about those qualities that are fruits of the Holy Spirit working in me. That it's not just about me ignoring my real self and trying to pretend. It's about saying, God, I want you to make me humble and gentle and patient and, and help me to be long-tempered, to be careful and kind, especially in my words. We made a joke about wearing those family church masks that say family church on them. That means that everything that comes out of your mouth better be filtered. We're not so worried as uh, the virus coming out as all the other stuff coming out. And there needs to be that, that filter that says, I want to bear with others. And boy, I tell you, this is a time frame when so many people are angry and upset and flaming each other on Facebook and and we need to be bearing with one another. And in our marriages, we need to be most patient. And so he says we accept one another, we bear with one another. And then it says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. And the word encouraging is actually an interesting word that has double meaning. When we think of encourage, we often think of coming alongside somebody who's down and discouraged and depressed and help picking them up, giving them some positive words, positive affirmation. And that, that is encouragement, and that's sorely needed. In fact, it's so easy in our marriages to pick at each other and to, and to say things that are not encouraging. And so he says, you need to be encouraging one another. But he also says at the beginning part of that verse, he says, I want you to consider how to spur one another on. And the, the spur one another actually is the same word as provoke. Only this isn't provoking to anger. This is provoking to love and good deeds. And so he literally says, I want you to challenge each other. I want this acceptance on the one side, which is I love you exactly as you are. But the challenging one another says, Sometimes you need to sit down and say, honey, can we talk? We need to have a conversation. This is a problem. This can't go on this way. And, and some of those conversations can be pretty intense and sometimes pretty difficult. So that idea that says stimulate or challenge or spur each other on to love. And of course, the first way you do that is by loving well. 
that you challenge somebody else to love by loving them, that you pour into them. But it also says there is this time where we challenge each other to good deeds, where we talk about the hard things and we say, you know, here's what I see in you and here's where I think God wants to take you to, to make you the best self that you can be. So the three I want you to focus on and think about this week are how well do I accept my spouse? Do I keep subtly trying to, to change them to, to make them less embarrassing to me or more amenable to my desires? Do I bear with them? Do I love them? First Peter says love covers a multitude of evil or sins, not, not meaning evil, but a multitude of irritations. And then thirdly, do I challenge my spouse? Do I think carefully? And here's, here's the critically important point. When you say we need to talk, it needs to be the right time, it needs to be the right tone, and it needs to be when the Holy Spirit prompts you so that you're not doing it to change them, to make them more like you want them to be, but you're changing them, you're trying to challenge them to be more like Christ wants them to be, to be their best self. And, and you and I know that that's often mixed. I want you to be your best self, but I, I really would like this part too. And mostly that's for me. And so I want you to think about those three qualities of great marriages because great marriages have these great foundational principles. And as I think back to the story of Skip and Debbie, I think, you know, I'll bet he had to wash her feet too. I'll bet literally he had to help her clean her feet and that that was a part of their marriage. And I don't know if that's totally foreign to your idea of marriage, to care for each other in those deep and humbling and, and maybe even embarrassing kinds of ways. But I will tell you that you can't possibly do it on your own. In fact, uh, when we talk about this high standard of marriage, I find that there's four responses. The first response is, <laughs> I feel like that is impossible and I feel guilty and I fail and I just kind of get down on myself. The second response is I blame my spouse or my parents or somebody else. If they had done a better job or if she were better or if he were better, then I could be more accepting and I could bear with one another and I, I could be more doing the right kind of challenging. And then the third response is that we often, <clears throat> excuse me, we often have this idea that those are too high and too difficult. And so we try to take God's great standard and we pull it down to say, just try to be kind of nice. And you know, that's rationalizing. Jesus doesn't call us to be kind of nice people. He calls us to love like Jesus. And so the fourth and the only good response is realizing, I can't do this. It's not difficult, it's impossible. And you're saying, Paul, I'm glad you finally said that because that's what I've been thinking the whole time. You know, it's impossible in our own strength. That when you come back to this basic lesson, that as I understand the love of Christ. In fact, Paul says, I wish you could understand how broad and wide and high and deep is the love and to experience that love. That when I'm pouring out love, knowing that Christ is going to keep pouring it into me, that then I am able to live in a supernatural way. In fact, let me give you even a greater encouragement. Over time, as God begins to work in you and as you begin to learn to love, God increases your capacity you see, you may start out with this much ability to love and in the process of time, God begins to extend and expand and the more he pours into you and the more you learn how to receive his love, the more you feel his love in you, the more then you are filled out and you can pour out in a much greater way because you have greater capacity. And that's what I hope for you, whether you are married or single, that you come to that place where you say, it's impossible but by the Spirit's work in me, by my receiving Jesus' love and letting him wash my feet, then I'm going to be able to wash the feet of my husband or my wife as well as the, the other people around my life. And I, I pray that you'd lean into that and say, God, what is it you're saying to me? I want to hear what you're saying. I want to be the kind of person that loves more like Jesus. I want to hand off to the campuses and to those of you who are watching online. Let God speak through this to your hearts.